All right, we're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Divi Chat, episode six. Our topic tonight for Divi Chat is positioning yourself to get into an agency freelance er partnership. We have a special guest that we'll introduce later, and let's go around the rooms and introduce ourselves. Gino. Hey there, everyone. My name is Gino Quiroz, and you can reach me on Twitter at G E N O Q. Thanks, Gino. Hi, Leslie. Hi, I am Leslie Burnell of A Girl in Her Mac, and you can find me on Facebook and Twitter at A Girl in Her Mac. <laughs> Fantastic. Hi, Sarah. Hi, guys. I'm Sarah Oates from Endure Web Studios. You can catch me on Facebook and Twitter at Endure Web. Fantastic. And hi, Tammy. Hello, everyone. I'm Tammy Grant of Sunflower Creatives. You can catch me on Twitter at Your Blog Place. Fantastic. And our special guest tonight, Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Walker. I uh, work for a company called Jamison Management and Marketing. Um, I'm the chief creative officer there. And you can find us on the web at www.jamisonmanagement.com. Fantastic. Woohoo! And my name is David Blackman, and I am with Aspen Grove Studios, a WordPress web development firm located all over the country. <laughs> I travel in my RV. All over the We're in your bathroom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, you can reach us at, at Aspen Grove LLC on Twitter. Uh, I do want to mention, segue a little bit. Last week we did not have Divi Chat because Tuesday night, big because things Trump. going on in the United States and <laughs> presidential elections, we decided to <clears throat> defer to this week so that's the reason why we weren't here um, let's go dive right into our topic you know I have quite a few questions about this is a topic that I'm interested in you know um, there's quite a few developers out there that will white label their services with ad agencies or you know marketing agencies and stuff so we're gonna kinda talk about that Andrea our guest tonight works for an ad agency and you know, she has a lot of experience with it. So I'm looking forward to hear about this topic and we'll kick it off. Does anybody want to start off with this topic? I'd love, <laughs> I, I don't mind jumping in here on this one. Um, ahead, you know, it, it's really interesting. Uh, white label web design for me was never on my agenda. It was never part of my strategy. It was never something as a United States based web designer. I thought I would ever be doing, um, but uh, now I find that white label web design is about 90% of my business, and it's been wonderful uh, working for other companies and uh, agencies, uh, IT companies, uh, folks who it's just one person and they're doing, you know, certain things, but they want to be able to provide web design. And um, I would just like to say, you know, this isn't something just for offshore people. Um, so if you're listening to this episode and you're wondering, well, what does that have to do with me? Listen, there's a strong demand for you Western based and uh, US based and England based uh, uh, white label design companies for what we're doing. So I think this is going to be an exciting topic. I can't wait to hear what others are doing with white label. Absolutely. I think it, it leads to one of the questions that I actually have here, which is, you know, if you're interested in white labeling with an ad agency, how do you market yourself to meet those agencies or Andrea, you know, how do you go about deciding, you know, finding the people that are going to white label for you and stuff? Um, I think the thing that we did most was, um, well, one, when we were looking for a new web development agency to partner with, um, I was inside the Divi groups. So I was seeing who was helping, who was providing feedback and who was being polite about it. Um, <laughs> you can, it does matter. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I found that the people who really wanted to help and the people who really um, were willing to go the effort, extra effort, were the people that were best to work with in the long run in an agency. Um, after I went through and just sat back and watched for a while and helped, had people help me, then I really started researching the company. So I think one of the best things to do as you establish yourself in this type of business is to really build a brand for yourself. 
Um, when marketing agencies or advertising agencies are looking for a partnership, they want to work with somebody who has established their self and has taken enough care to build out their brand and who they are. So that was one of the most important things that I looked for when I was looking for a partner to um, partner with us. Fantastic. I know some of the other developers here have experience with white label too. Leslie? <laughs> I do, and actually it's very much similar to Gino. Um, it sort of fell in my lap. I didn't seek to try to do that. Um, I, I, it just never really occurred to me, but once I started offering the, um, the Divi audit, my business kind of took a turn and I started getting seeked out. Uh, it, it became more of not just an audit on individual like DIYer type sites. Um, I started getting approached about, well, hey, we're this company and we, you know, maybe they have a designer, but they don't have, they have too much work to, for that, for their, their people on staff or whatever. Um, and so it kind of just progressed. And I, right now, I probably have to say, about 70% of my work is white label and 30% is just custom Divi sites or just me doing doing my own thing. Um, and, and like Gino, I've worked with single developers who just run their own little company, um, as well as now I'm doing working with bigger, bigger agencies and I'm like just one little cog in their, you know, big machine. Um, but I, I like it a lot. I, I, I love working with clients, but I also love not working with clients. <laughs> so it gives me that, <laughs> that space where I can just, I get a lot of leeway and thankfully everyone who's approached me and that I've um, partnered with gives me a lot of freedom in the design. So, you know, I don't still don't feel like I have a boss really. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I, 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 it wasn't something I planned, like I said, but it's my kind of my favorite thing right now. <laughs> Yeah, I do have a question that that brings up a question for me is if you do do white label work and none of your work is is kind of out there for the world to see. Are you scared? Are you nervous? If you lose those relationships with those agencies, what work do you show, you know, for, hey, for the past five years, I've been doing white label work, which is <laughs> kind of hidden from the world. How do you go about handling that? Is that a concern or a fear that you have? That's not really for me. I think I, I still keep one foot in the, you know, in my own company and I have the child themes to always revert to as well. Um, as far as my, my online portfolio right now, if you go to my site, I have, been, it's been dwindling down. I've been taking, you know, the, I think I had like 10 slides going through of work that I've done and I think it's down to five or something now. So yeah, you know, it's, it's a give and take, but I'm not really concerned at, at this point. I think also, as you do white label work for a company, once you develop that relationship and the relationship goes well, those companies are going to do anything they can to help your business thrive. They want to see you succeed so they can keep working with you. Um, so even though you can't put that work on your own website, I'm always willing to give a great testimonial about how easy it is to work with my developer or anything like that. So it's about developing that relationship and that trust. Okay. That's I think there's also the possibility of some people are open to you still putting it on your portfolio. So it's worth having that discussion when you first start a relationship with someone because sometimes people will say, well, we don't want you to mark on the website that you did it, but we're okay with you actually putting this on your own website. So I've got a couple of um, sites that are on my own portfolio. Mm. But if you went to the site, you wouldn't know that I did it, but they gave me the permission to put it on my own. So I didn't publicize it through Facebook. I didn't like go hardcore when it was went live saying, I did this, I did this, but I was allowed <laughs> to there. just quietly put it on my portfolio. <laughs> yeah, and they were fine. And we, we, I just made sure we were really open about that right up front, that we had had the discussion to say, yes, you can or no, you can't. Um, and most of the time it'll be no, but sometimes people are okay with you just sticking it on your portfolio. So it's worth asking the question. That's good. I, I actually never even asked. I always just assume no. <laughs> That's good yeah. to ask. <laughs> yeah. For me, one of the for me one of the things is is um, that's why you continuously want to still uh, not forget about that being involved in the community and doing community type projects because 
Um, yeah, my portfolio doesn't have anything recent, and everyone knows, you know, we've been super busy, but uh, the fact that I have layout packs out there and child themes out there and new tutorials, trying to squeeze in the time to keep fresh stuff out there because mm -hmm. for me, what's attracted all my clients was seeing my work, seeing, seeing um, the stuff I keep on the blog, the tutorials, and uh, the child themes, which are my design, so they get to see my design still and what I'm capable of. Um, so you want to kind of, there's one of the advantages of keeping that going, even though things start getting busy, because that becomes your portfolio. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I have another question. Uh, this has to do with finances and, you know, discounts. If you work, typically if you work with an agency, my experience anyway is that you'll, we will give a certain percentage discount for consistent regular work that's coming in on a regular basis. Um, what percentage discount do you guys go to? Is it off of your regular rates? Do you charge your full rates uh, in order to work with a relationship with an agency? Uh, well, for me, um, I, I, starting out with a new with a new company or person, I, my white label rate is actually a little higher than my regular rate. Uh, Mostly to compensate for the fact that it's not going to be shown anywhere. Nobody's going to know that know that I do it, um, and if it's not on my portfolio. But um, I have worked with someone where you know you sometimes you get these offers, and they're like, "Well, we're going to give you more work. We'll give you more work." And you got to take that with a grain of salt because you know yeah. not everybody actually will. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, but uh, this person he did keep giving me work, and so. We had already a bit of a track record and relationship. So when I ended up raising my my rates um, a few months ago, when he came back to me for another project, uh, I didn't raise my rate for him because I knew he was going to continue to give me work, and and that was kind of it was my thank you basically. Um, so so you know there's exceptions to the rule for me, um, but generally my white label is higher than my regular rate. Gotcha. Well, that's that's good to know. Yeah, and I would say oh, one I have. Thing to to keep in mind when you do work with agencies is to keep that rate consistent because most of the time when agencies roll out their prices, they're for an entire year. So if for yeah. some reason we consistently give um, a partner work and all of a sudden we're, we're being charged more for that than we had thought, we're not going to make a better, a very good return on our investment with that client. So, um, we're probably going to seek out a different partner at that point because once a project is no longer profitable for us, then we can't we can't continue to do that type of project with with our partner. So I would say that you always want to have that open conversation and you always want to put your fees out in front of them so they always know what they're going to pay in the end. That's yeah, I can share one little experience with what um, <clears throat> work that we did this year with the promise of somebody reached out to us, hey, I'm with an ad agency, we've got a ton of work, you know, would love to partner with you, and we're just gonna keep sending you, I've got four projects in the pipeline, and, you know, negotiating, trying to hammer me down on price, and I was willing to discount for the, the opportunity of, you know, more work coming down the line and stuff, <laughs> and, I almost, you see how much hair I have. I don't have any, <laughs> but I was pulling what little bit I had left out by the end of that project and swore I would never do that again. Yeah. So I kind of agree with, with Leslie, at least initially, I learned a valuable lesson. You know, um, charge your regular rates at least at first, your first project. Mm -hmm. If they continue to send work to you, Go ahead and discount if you feel free, and that's kind of how that's kind of where we're at now. Corey and I made a decision: no more of that upfront, <laughs> good boy, you know, good faith stuff until we've worked with them. Yeah, and I, I think it's a really. Sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I was just gonna say I think it's really tricky. Like, there, there's so many sides to it. There is the fact that you have to cover your own expenses, like that time that you're spending you can't spend on other work. So to charge your regular rate means that you're getting the same amount of income as if you were doing other work. But at the same time, you don't have to do the sales for that work. And so I, I think it's a really tricky thing. I, I wanna charge my regular rate, but at the same time, 
if someone is going to start to give me regular work, I'm not having to do the sales. I'm not having to meet with the client and all of a sudden I'm just doing the work and I can afford for that rate to be a bit cheaper for the fact that I don't then have to be doing this other side of the work, which is the admin side of the work or the sales side of the work. Someone else is doing that for me. And I can actually afford, as long as it is going to be ongoing, I think your idea, um, David, is a good idea of um, full rate initially and then maybe thinking about dropping it. I mean, everyone's in a different position, right? Like not everyone can afford to drop their rate. Maybe they are already got a really low rate. But like I have a cheaper rate for my maintenance clients when I do like maintenance work for them. So kind of bringing a white label thing um, into that perspective might be able to keep you working with them. But I think it's a... It's a case by case basis. Like some people can afford your regular rate and you'd be stupid to then discount that. And some people can't <laughs> afford it. And so it's kind of a matter of working out, well, can they afford it or can't they? Like I've got an agency I'm working for at the moment and basically they just find out what the client can afford. And then they take a bit off the top and they offer me the rest. And they just say, are you willing to do it for this particular amount of money? And they make sure they take a generous, I mean, they're taking something like 20% at the top and then I just take the rest to design and build and they've got the sales. So I didn't have to do anything. So it varies who you're going to be working with. And I think it's important to be open to that discussion, not just kind of coming in full strong, like this is the only way it can work, but just maybe seeing where they're at and what might. Don't discount yourself unnecessarily, but also don't, put yourself out of the running, I guess. Yeah. Makes sense. Good advice. Yeah. Tell me. Oops. Oh, <laughs> I was going to ask Andrea what she was going to say before. Oh, yeah. oh, I, no, I think, I think it's good to start that at the beginning and then see what the volume of clients they bring. You know, I think yeah even reestablishing what your relationship is every quarter is, is a great start with an agency as well. Oh, wow. That's good information. Yeah. We should pick your brain more. We've, this is valuable insider information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I don't even know that I'm, I'm using the term agency or, or company really loosely because I guess my biggest um, partner right now, they're not really an agency. They're, they're a college and they have a lot of, um, it, it's one big website, and then they have a lot of smaller, like sub sites or whatever. So, in this, in the scope of how many people you know are in that company, I, I deal with one person. But it's to me, uh, being a little fish, you know, that's in a bigger, you know, a bigger deal to deal with. So I, I call them an agency, but they're really not. It's, it's just one big school. Um, so you know, it can come in all forms too. Yeah. Yeah, I think partnerships, um, yeah. um, even through different companies, are going to look a lot different. Uh, through the next 10 years because agencies and marketing companies are starting to really have to diversify themselves and to take on a bunch of different skill sets inside of that one agency is almost impossible. So I think that as the years go on, you'll see those agencies break up a bit and more contractors and more freelancers have more, um, have more, get more of those projects from those those marketers and agencies because they can't take those in-house. So I think that's kind of how freelancers and contractors are really going to break into the game more than they did, say, five years ago. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to position ourselves as right now, um, preparing for that, trying to uh, be able to project uh, exact specialties. I remember we were at a WordCamp conference and uh, uh, Chris Lehman was talking about, you know, don't be going around saying you're an expert at everything because I'll say baloney and I won't hire you. And so I asked him afterwards, well, what if you do do all these different areas? How do you do it? And he's like, landing pages, right? And I'm like, well, okay, that's okay, that's not really a helpful answer. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we're trying to figure out how to position ourselves so that we can um, there are certain niches that we are good at, you know, and um, so it's really interesting. But I think you you nailed it, Andrea, that there's going to be a lot more. We have, like like you, Leslie, we have one client's just a big business, and they have their own web team, but they hire us out for about 10, 15 hours a month for special things they can't do. We have another one who just he does fixes computers, and we do his websites for him. And we got, you know, another one that's an agency, then we got another one that 
Um, he's a web designer and just needs help because he doesn't know Divi well enough yet. So we have all these different types, you know, all types. So yeah. it's amazing <laughs> what what can be done out there now as far as self employment. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Tammy, Tammy do you have any experience? Yes, actually, I say about thirty percent of my business now is white label, and um, I to get a case by case basis on how much I'll charge. I've been, um, I guess, I've been burned in the past. If you don't charge enough, you can end up upside down on the project. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Nice. Depending on the size. Yeah, really, absolutely. Fast. Well, Gino, you've worked with Andrea, right? Yes. We, we need to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, that I don't know why you're starting it. Come on. Well, that's about that. <laughs> yes. Uh, Gino and I have pro I've worked to, together for about 16 months now. We've wow. built about 36 websites, 38 websites together oh my gosh. over the yeah. last 16 months. So that's when it becomes, you know, more of a partnership, I would say, than a white label. And I think, oh, yeah. which I'll let Gino talk at you know see his experience but I think um, Gino's probably the best partner anybody could have asked for in the last 16 months and I think <laughs> the thing <laughs> I reported who <laughs> well I found Gino I was the one that just stayed in the Divi groups and and uh, to see who was nice to me, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I was brand new to Divi. I didn't know anything about it. I was honestly brand new to web design, and I was afraid trying to find a developer to help me because I didn't want to look like I didn't know anything, you know. And he really came to a level, to the level that I was at, and helped me learn and build what I needed to know in order to go back and be successful at the company that I work for. So I think um, some of the best things that I've learned with partnering with him is one, to become a partner with inside the organization uh, and really help them with what they need, uh, help them creatively brainstorm their problems and come to them at a level that they can understand and and just really work with, work alongside of them and become their partner. So. Yeah, and I would I would say one of the things that I've learned that I believe what helps make it a go from a subcontractor relationship to a partnership is we have to look at it as subcontractors. We have to look at it as we're going in and we can't be that guy or gal that says I'm the specialist and I'm going to keep all my secrets. You know, we got to be willing to go in there and say, Andrea, I'll teach you. I'll explain to you everything I've done. I'll show you where everything's at. Uh, the more you can learn, the more you can take in house. That's fine with me. And to have that like you were if you were working together in the workplace, you know, you work as a team, you hand things off and, and you train and you teach. And I think that's what's been really successful. She now sends me half the work she used to because she does it all herself. And it's marvelous <laughs> to see that she can do that now. And I think that's what uh, builds trust. And it, the turnaround for me is she just, she throws work at me, doesn't ask me how long it's going to take. She just trusts my every judgment, my every decision. And, uh, you know, I respect that, you know, it, it's hard to find partners like that. So it goes <laughs> both ways. Yeah. Andrea, I have a question for you. Um, in regards to when you're working with someone like Gino and stuff, do you allow them to communicate with the clients? Is he a Jameson representative or do you do white label, do agencies not allow web developers to communicate? How does that work, if at all? Uh, well, we keep Gino out of client communications because we are fortunate enough to have a team of marketing advisors. So, mm -hmm. um, and they're and project managers. So, though they're actually on the front line, always communicating with the client. So, my role is more of like a creative director, where I don't really partner with clients either. So, it all kind of comes down the line. Um, we have had quite a few instances where. We just were not understanding what the client needed. I needed backup on a phone call because everything that I was saying was being questioned. And Gino has stepped up quite a few times and just 
became part of the Jameson team and answered questions. And so anytime that you can provide backup or a helping hand, you know, is, is definitely valuable to a team member who's in need. Absolutely. I think that one will vary to place as well. Uh, one of the people I work for, they just set up a base camp and they add me in as if I'm just one of their team. And so they just tell the clients, um, this is the developer that's working on your site. And so I just pretend that I'm part of their team and that just, you know, so it means I can ask questions if I need to. They've got the basic brief, but I have access to the client if I need it. Um, and that seems to work pretty well as well. So I think place to place will work differently as well. Yeah. yeah, that was kind of my, my curiosity is how do you handle because the white label project that I referred to earlier that we worked on, this was not within the scope of the project and we were basically their tech team. So they didn't understand the technical aspects of the project because it was a really technical project where we integrated a, a CRM with a, their website and built some custom plugins for them and they could not customer when the customer because the customer had their own tech team and oh the, their tech team was asking questions that the agency had no clue how to answer so they yeah. brought us in and they wanted us to be on the on the phone calls that you know and we hadn't bid this in properly and stuff so I learned a lesson there if you're going to be working with an agency find out if you if they're going to be want you to be a part of their team and that's okay we were a part of that agency's team you know yeah. we went on under the guise of hey this is David the technical you know partner on our team and he'll answer any questions that you have the problem that I didn't know is that it wasn't you know discussed or talked about when we went in up front so and there was a lot of it so if you're doing this type of stuff you know make sure that you realize that that may be part of, of the white labeling work as well Hmm. That's interesting. I guess as long as you're charging for it. Sorry. Yeah. Here. No, I haven't. Um, I, I don't do have. Yeah, nine times out of ten, I don't have any contact with the client. Um, I'm not brought into any kind of team or anything. The only time I've ever been brought in on a on a base camp actually is only with Gino when I was working on on something with him. <laughs> um, but like, uh, no, I, I have I have learned that I need to have one contact. Um, I was working with. Um, a company out in California and it ended up we didn't it was my fault I didn't say who right away who, who is my my go-to person who am I gonna deal with and I would have different conflicting they conflicted and what they wanted and so it came down to me and I felt it was really awkward uh, so now I know going in that I, I need to I always try to just get one person to deal with who am I gonna answer to who's gonna answer you know tell me what, what I need to do and stuff like that um, but yeah I, I'm not I guess they don't want me on their team yet. <laughs> no one's invited me into that. <laughs> well, this time is flying by really fast, guys. Um, it is already seven. Oh, wow. I've got one more quick question, um, finance-wise. Do you guys always charge per hour, or on some of these jobs, do you get told like just a big lump sum, or um, or do you get asked to quote like a for the whole job, it'll be this particular amount of money, or do you always quote per hour? I now always we quote per hour. Just yeah, so we, that if it goes over, you're all right. Uh, well, I tend to quote in chunks, um, like either mm. every five hours I'll bill or every 10 hours I'll bill. Um, it, it just, it seems, it, so far it's worked really well for me and for them, um, and I just keep my, my time log. <laughs> Yeah, I think for uh, for us, we we bid mostly by projects, depending on the project. Um, we do have some hourly cases, but it's not typically when it's a an entire web design build. It's typically if they need help with something, we'll go hourly. Other than that, it's mostly by project. And for me, I don't. Um, I do build it in Divi, but it's primarily design. If I need to hand off something to their, they they almost always have a developer team. So I, a lot of times I'll be like, hey, I need this plugin. Can you put it in? Or can you build this for me? I need this to happen. Um, and a, a lot of it's mostly front end that I deal with. Um, and a lot of times we go in, I start with the home page, and it's, it's very um, a la carte, sort of. If, if they want templates, maybe I'm not going to do every page. They just want me to do some layouts. Um, so it's very much as we go. So that's why I, I prefer to do it that way. 
And usually, if yeah. they're very happy, they'll um, they'll be like, okay, well, now we have something else, actually. So it almost always <laughs> leads to more work <laughs> doing it this way for me. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really I'm good. Learning. It's really interesting. Yeah, there's uh, many ways to, you know, make an income with web development. You've got front end web developer white label work with Leslie. You've got Gino who does <laughs> everything. <laughs> yards, you know, several others. So I'm, I'm seeing, I'm hoping that the audience is seeing as well that if you're a designer, you know, you can white label with an agency as well. You don't have to technically be a developer. You can offer those services and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, the other thing I didn't mention at the beginning, when you said about how to set yourself up to be kind of picked cut, I think we've all said we never went out looking for it. I don't think any of us went looking for white label work. Um, but I think if you keep your portfolio up to date and you make sure that you put your good stuff on there, that's good quality, that you've made a really big effort with that, you're proud of and you want more work like that, that helps. But also keep your LinkedIn up to date. So I've started oh. getting inquiries through LinkedIn and um what i'm i know like i hate linkedin right like i'm not interested in it at all however say that, Sarah. And, and I know, right? people are starting to find me through linkedin so they'll go to my linkedin and i do have like a pretty detailed thing um in, description in there but saying that you do wordpress saying what parts of wordpress that you do that even that you're open to doing white label work or whatever having a few of your projects in there because you can upload them making sure you kind of network with local people because what I'm finding is people within my hometown are looking for local people they can white label out to um, and then making sure you've got a clear link to your website so that then they can go from your LinkedIn to your website, see your really great portfolio and then contact you through there. Um, so yeah, that's my other tip is LinkedIn. Even if you hate it, do it. <laughs> so what I, I feel so bad when someone endorses love. me and I don't endorse back. I'm like, oh, I gotta do it. <laughs> so what I heard you say, Sarah, is that you love LinkedIn now. <laughs> well, it's getting me work, right? Like it is actually a really legitimate way of people finding you. Um, for white label work. Yeah. I'm not getting regular websites through it, but I am getting white label stuff through LinkedIn cool. and it was a surprise, but it's worth investing in. Interesting. Good points. Fantastic. Well, this has been a, been a great, great episode. Andrea, do you have any um, parting thoughts, words of wisdom for coming from the agency side <laughs> that you want to share with us? I don't think I have any more thoughts. Be <laughs> nice. Just be nice. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> be nice. Nobody right. likes to work with an asshole. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we have enough clients for that. <laughs> well, that's, I think this has been great, guys. This has been uh, Divi Chat, episode six. Hard to believe episode six is almost in the books. Um, Look forward to next week as well. Andrea, thank you so much for thank coming you all on, for having on me. with us. Hey. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. All right, everybody. Until next week, we'll see you. Have a right. good week. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye.